In the English-speaking world, the most popular alternate histories focus on the American Civil War or World War II. But in Spain, the most popular what-if involves the Spanish Civil War. But as Francisco J. Lopez Arias pointed out in his 2017 article for Science Fiction Studies, it would be naive, however, to assume that this has always been the case. In fact, it was not so until 1976. That was the year Jesus Turbado's novel, On This Day in 1976, an alternate history set a timeline where Republicans won the Spanish Civil War, won the Premio Panetta, a Spanish literary prize. However, such a work could only be produced at the time because the victor of said civil war, the dictator Francisco Franco, had recently died, and Spain was transitioning into a democracy. Censorship was ending, and people were free to imagine their oppressors losing. Now, I haven't read on this day myself, but I too wonder what would have happened if the Republicans won the Spanish Civil War. Hello everyone, I'm Matt Mitrovich, the alternate historian. In this video, we are discussing the Spanish Civil War and how the world would be different if the fascists lost. We begin, as always, with the historical context. By the 20th century, Spain was in a bad place. Despite at one point ruling a good chunk of the planet, this vast colonial empire did little to improve the life of your average Spaniard. The harsh rule of the landowning nobility and the Catholic Church with their inquisition, plus the desire for Spain to be centralized rather than allowing the different cultural regions, such as Catalonia and the Basque Country, to have autonomy made a lot of people angry. Add a bunch of corruption in Madrid, ineffective monarchs, and a population that rarely went to church, and Spain became polarized between two factions. A rising liberal movement that wanted reforms, and a bunch of conservatives who absolutely rejected any changes to the status quo. The constitutional monarchy that came to Spain in the late 19th century didn't help much. Elections were mostly shams as poor Spaniards were forced to vote for whoever their landlord approved of. Meanwhile, corruption was so bad that the opposing political parties openly cooperated with each other to maintain the status quo rather than institute any real changes. Economically, 20th century Spain had a mostly agricultural economy and was stricken with high rates of poverty, economic inequality, corruption, low literacy rates, and low life expectancy. There was a brief economic boom around World War I, but the economic downturn that followed led to more resentment among the populace, and thus ideas such as socialism, communism, and anarchism spread like wildfire among the middle and working classes. Union membership increased, but attempts to use strikes to spur social change were violently put down by the conservative military. Nevertheless, the radicalization of the populace continued, and the success of the Bolsheviks in Russia was a rallying cry for leftists in Spain. And yet, despite the clamor for change, the Spanish government was slow to do anything to address the unrest outside of the usual arrests and random killings. Now, the 1920s were marked by a military dictatorship, which had some support for bringing stability to the nation and having moderate socialists in the government, but it became increasingly unpopular for ruling by decree, taking on national debt to fund useless public work projects, and refusing to pursue any real land reforms. Eventually, the dictatorship was overthrown in 1930, and a republic was declared in 1931 as King Alfonso XIII went into exile, ending the Kingdom of Spain, if only briefly. Although it had mass popular support, the New Republic faced many challenges. Not only did they have to deal with the same problems that had been dragging Spain down for decades, but they also faced hostile and reactionary institutions like the Catholic Church and the Army. And they had to do this all during the Great Depression. Nevertheless, the Republic did push forward with many reforms. Land reform went through and Canelodia gained autonomy within the Republic. Women gained the right to vote and literacy rates increased thanks to a better funded public education system. The Republic also restricted the size of the military and promoted freedom of religion and separation of church and state. However, not only did this radicalize the church and military further, it did nothing to appease many radical leftists. Churches were burned down, massive strikes were organized, and there was even a left-wing revolt in the province of Asturias in 1934. Although these acts were punished, the fear that it could lead to a Bolshevik-esque revolution in Spain drove many people to the Spanish right, which was becoming increasingly influenced by fascists like the Falanges. Spain was basically a powder keg, ready to blow. The spark came on July 17, 1936. A group of generals in the Spanish army had plotted to overthrow the government in a coup. They planned a coordinated rising starting in Spanish Morocco by the elite Army of Africa, whose soldiers were recruited among the native Moroccans, followed by the rising of garrisons across Spain. The navy would then ferry the Army of Africa to Europe, and the republic would be swiftly crushed. Despite ample evidence that it was about to happen, the republican government did nothing to prevent it, and when it finally did happen, they were slow to respond. Still, the Republic was lucky enough that many of the garrisons in Spain failed to rebel, 
This was due largely in part to local officials opening the armories to civilians, especially union workers, who then quickly surrounded the barracks and forced the rebels to surrender. Even better for the Republic, the Navy mostly stayed loyal thanks to the crews overthrowing their officers and seizing the ships. The bad news was that the rebels still managed to secure Spanish Morocco and other parts of the Spanish mainland. Many local officials in these places had refused to arm civilians, especially those affiliated with the Communist Party, and thus found themselves facing rebel soldiers who passed out the weapons instead to their supporters, which included the fascists who then used them against civilians suspected of any leftist sympathies. To make matters worse, while the Navy stayed loyal to Republic, the Army of Africa was still able to be airlifted to Europe thanks in part to planes supplied by the Germans. So you started a few wars, alright? So you actually started everywhere. I mean, who's counting? Thus, the Spanish Civil War had begun. Now, I'm not going to recount the name of every commander or battle in this war, because that's honestly not important. If you want a detailed summary of this conflict, go check out The Battle for Spain by Antony Beevor, which is a great read and a major source for this video. I will say that this war was a confused and bloody mess. Both sides tend to overemphasize bravery and propaganda victories over useful battlefield tactics or war-winning strategies, causing thousands to unnecessarily die. There were certainly atrocities on both sides, but some of the propaganda connected with them has become so ingrained in the historical record, it's honestly hard to know what really happened and what is exaggerations or outright lies. Still, I can say the rebels, also known as the nationalists, were generally unified. Their factions, including monarchists, fascists, and other conservative authoritarians, did not have irreconcilable differences and were able to be organized under a single leader, Franco, who was lucky enough that any serious challenger was dead or in exile. The nationalists also had the advantage of better soldiers and they controlled the best farmland. The latter was important because the nationalists were able to feed their forces a lot easier than the republic. On the other hand, the Republicans were made up of people of various political ideologies that were often at odds with each other. You had liberals, socialists, communists, anarchists, and even Basque and Catalan separatists. Indeed, it was not unusual for these groups to fight amongst themselves. And while the Republic's military was at first a bunch of ad hoc workers' militias, it was soon organized into a more professional force, which had a numerical edge over its nationalist adversaries. More importantly, the Republic controlled most of Spain's industry and major cities, including the capital Madrid, thanks in part to Republican forces who led a heroic defense of the city in the early stages of the war. Meanwhile, the Republic was experiencing a revolution within its territory. Moderate liberals were sidelined as leftist politicians secured major roles in the government. Revolutionary committees were set up to govern cities, towns, and villages. Many farms voluntarily collectivized, which incidentally improved agricultural output in eastern Spain for a while, and those farmers that didn't were basically left alone. Heck, Spanish anarchists found themselves in the majority of Catalonia, and yet willingly gave themselves a minority position in the new government in order to avoid a tyranny of the majority over the non-anarchists in the region. But this revolution didn't go over well with the rest of the world. Despite vast popular support for the Republic among their people, the governments of America, Britain, and France stayed neutral and denied requests for military aid from the Republic. In fact, many conservative, wealthy elites in those countries who either feared the spread of Bolshevism or else were fascists themselves found ways to support the nationalists, such as then CEO of Texaco, who sold oil to the nationalists, and hey, where did this article from 2023 come from? That's weird. But while the capitalist democracy stayed neutral, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy got involved. Along with providing money, guns, tanks, planes, and other war material to the nationalists, both Germany and Italy sent troops to fight for Franco. Thousands of Italian soldiers were sent to the front lines of the Civil War, while the Germans sent the Condor Legion. This German Air Force unit tested new planes and tactics during the war, which came in handy for the next one. The Legion was also responsible for the bombing of the Basque town of Guernica, which some estimate caused the death of 1,600 people. This tragedy was later immortalized by the Pablo Picasso painting, Guernica. That said, many people from across the world did volunteer the fight for the Republic and were organized into the famous International Brigades. However, the biggest supporter of the Republic during the war was the Soviet Union. They provided the Republic with troops, supplies, and weapons that were desperately needed. Unfortunately, this turned out to be a mixed blessing for the Republic. Not only did it require them to hand over their gold reserves to the Soviets, but it also meant the Spanish Communists gained more power within the government. Although they were one of the most organized factions in the Republic, they were also one of the most authoritarian and tended to ape Stalinist paranoia, 
A secret police was soon established that led to purges against any perceived enemies of the Republic, which more often than not targeted anarchists and Trotskyists. Communists also made up most of the officers of the Republic's army, and rather than stay on the defensive and force the numerically inferior nationalists to waste troops attacking them, they instead led ill-planned and costly offenses that quickly ended whatever numbers advantage the Republic had. These failures were then blamed on an enemy fifth column, which led to even more purges. Thus, any idealism that the Spanish Republic once possessed was quickly crushed as the Spanish communists took more and more power. The complete mismanagement of the Republican war effort meant that on April 1st, 1939, only months before World War II was to begin, the Nationalists conquered all of Spain, leading to a decades-long military dictatorship that isolated Spain from the rest of the world until the later years of Franco's life. Still, this dictatorship would come to an end in 1975 with Franco's death. In a surprise move, the restored King of Spain, Juan Carlos I, brought back democracy and even allowed the Communist Party to run candidates in elections. But what if democracy survived? What if the Republic won the Spanish Civil War? It might not be that difficult to accomplish. In our timeline, the rising almost failed at the start because of what happened in Spain proper. As previously mentioned, Republican officials opening the armories to the people forced the surrender of many would-be rebels. So if just a few more officials did the same, or else the Republican government was a little bit more competent, more of Spain would be under Republican control, and the government would be better able to defend Spain when or if the Army of Africa was brought over. In fact, a failure by the Nationalists to secure more of Spain might even convince the Germans, Italians, and other sympathizers to abandon the Nationalists as a lost cause. Thus, Franco might not get German planes to transport the Army of Africa to Europe, and while he may eventually figure a way to get them across, any delays would give the Republic more time to liberate territory occupied by the rebels, or allow the Republican Navy or Air Force to intercept any attempts at a crossing. You can even cause some disunity among the Nationalists by butterflying away a death that happened shortly after the Rising began. In our timeline, the monarchist general Jose San Urjo was expected to be the commander-in-chief of the Nationalists, but he died in a plane crash only three days after the Rising began. This led to a power vacuum that was quickly filled by Franco. But in this alternate timeline, with the multitude of failures racking up for the Nationalists, perhaps General Sanierjo does not take that fateful flight and thus lives to command the Nationalists. If a power struggle then develops between Sanierjo and Franco, it could make it next to impossible for the Nationalists to effectively fight the Republic. Thus the Republic's military, still likely receiving aid from the Soviets since the capitalist democracies would probably not want to arm the leftist revolution that may likely still be happening in this alternate timeline, are able to liberate rebel territory, inflict several defeats on what units of the Army of Africa are able to make it to Spain. Franco and other nationalists, realizing the war is lost, flee to friendly places like Portugal, Italy, and Germany, while the Republican Navy transports troops to reoccupied Spanish Morocco and any island territories still held by the rebels. So, the Republic has won the Civil War. But what happens next? Well, for one thing, there is one more country in the world with the color purple on its flag. But on a more serious note, the victorious Republic would be a lot more leftist politically. As mentioned in our timeline, moderate liberals fell from power and this would likely continue to be the case in this alternate timeline. So expect more socialists, communists, and perhaps even anarchists in the government. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, these factions fought amongst themselves almost as often as they fought the nationalists. And without a common enemy to face, these old rivalries are likely to erupt again. Thus, I see three paths for the victorious republic to take in this alternate timeline. The first is a communist Spain. This is because the Spanish communists were the most organized and fastest growing faction during the Civil War, and were one of the few factions who had the direct support of a great power, the Soviet Union. Their tendency to purge people from other factions also meant they are unlikely to tolerate competition in the Republic. As one political commissar in Spain confidently wrote to Moscow during the war, and I quote, Victory is not possible without the active participation of the communists. Victory means an even greater strengthening of the position of the Communist Party. A final victory over the enemy means for the whole world, the political hegemony of the Communist Party in Spain. A republic in Spain, raised from the ruins of fascism and led by communists. A free Spain of a new republican type, organized with the help of competent people, will be a great economic and military power, carrying out a policy of solidarity and close connections with the Soviet Union. So, the Republic of Spain becomes the People's Republic of Spain. The second scenario is that any attempted communist takeover 
fails, and fighting breaks out between the various factions, including Basque and Catalan separatists. The Spanish Civil War thus continues, except without the Nationalists. Now, the Communists would still retain most of their advantages, however, with World War II likely happening in Europe, it's unlikely the Soviet Union would be sending them any weapons. This scenario is certainly likely, especially when you consider the Warlord era in China lasted from 1916 to 1928, and then the Civil War between the Chinese Nationalists and Communists lasted from then to 1949. So a longer Civil War is still a plausible scenario for Spain. The third and perhaps best case scenario for Spain is that Spain retains a republican government but one dominated by leftist political parties that tolerate each other's existence. This isn't completely implausible since as mentioned during the civil war the anarchists willingly gave themselves a minority position in the Catalonian government. Meanwhile the Soviet Union supported keeping Spain a democratic republic during the war in order to avoid alienating the British and French by making it seem like the republic was experiencing a Bolshevik resolution. So on my alternate timeline, they may continue with this policy and instruct the Spanish communists to play by the rules. But assuming that Republican Spain is relatively stable after the Civil War, what else is happening in and around Spain? Well, during the Civil War, there was some in the Republic who reached out to Moroccan leaders about granting them their independence should they rise in revolt against the Nationalists. Given that Spanish Morocco is where the Army of Africa recruited from, the victorious Republic might cut Spanish Morocco loose so it couldn't be used for any future power grabs. This would certainly cause problems for France who controlled most of Morocco and might have to deal with revolts in their territory. And what happens to nationalist sympathizers still in Spain? Well, this is a touchy subject in our timeline, but as far as I can tell, the massacres and assorted war crimes committed by the nationalists during and after the Civil War were worse and in far greater numbers than anything the Republic may have done. Given some estimates, the number of people killed in nationalist purges was close to 200,000. But would a victorious republic meet or exceed those numbers in their own purges? I mean, maybe? As Bivor pointed out in Battle for Spain, as a general rule, the winner in a civil war executes more enemies than the loser. So while it might feel right to say the republic wouldn't be as bad as the nationalists, there were certainly many examples of class enemies being killed by leftist militias. Personally, I think you would see similar bloodshed in the scenarios where Spain becomes a communist dictatorship or the civil war continues. Only in my third scenario, where the Democratic Republic continues on, that I think you see the establishment of law and order across the state stemming any retributions against former nationalists. Of course, we also have to consider the time frame of all this is running up against the ticking time bomb that is World War II. I don't think it's controversial to say that World War II would probably still happen regardless of the events in Spain, although tell me in the comments if you disagree. But how it played out could certainly be different. For example, the Condor Legion got a lot of combat experience which was useful for the Luftwaffe when World War II finally began, but in my alternate timeline, this experience is never gained and thus the German Air Force probably performs more poorly at the start of the conflict. But then again, in our timeline, Italy spent billions of dollars in today's money supporting Franco's regime, but if this money isn't spent, Italy is probably better off at the start of World War II, at least financially. Heck, maybe the Axis wouldn't even exist in this alternate timeline. Despite being ideologically aligned, Germany and Italy didn't exactly get along in the 1930s. Italy particularly didn't like Germany's desire to annex Austria, which they did in 1938, because Italy didn't want to share a border with a powerful German state. The Spanish Civil War, however, gave both Germany and Italy an opportunity to work together, which probably went a long way to improve relations between the two. But in its alternate timeline, that might not happen. But assuming World War II still plays out as we know it in its broadest strokes, the Spanish Republic would likely stay neutral in the war since they'd still be recovering from the Civil War or else still fighting it. Certainly the Spanish Communists would tone down their anti-fascist rhetoric once the molotov ribbentrop Pact was announced. However, I think it is overly optimistic to say Spain would be able to remain neutral in this alternate timeline. You see, in our timeline, the Germans did have a plan called Operation Felix to capture the British fortress at Gibraltar by sending troops through Spain to attack it directly in order to cut off the Mediterranean from British shipping. This plan hinged on the cooperation of Franco, who was reluctant to give it not just because Spain was still recovering from the recent civil war, but also because Spain depended on Britain for food and fuel. Thus Franco demanded massive amounts of economic and military aid from Germany, along with various territorial concessions. Hitler balked at these demands, and thus Spain stayed neutral. However, in this alternate timeline, Hitler might just invade Spain, and Portugal too for that matter, and occupy it in order to move the necessary troops through it to capture Gibraltar. 
Also, the Nazis certainly would not want a state aligned with the Soviet Union on their western flank at the start of Operation Barbarossa, a.k.a. the invasion of the USSR. Torbato's novel on this day in 1976 also has Spain invaded by the Germans, so I'm not the only alternate historian who has considered it. Meanwhile, the exiled Franco might put himself forward to Hitler as the perfect puppet ruler of Spain. However, this invasion may not go well for the Nazis. In our timeline, there were guerrilla fighters who opposed Franco even years after the Civil War ended. So in this alternate timeline, a victorious republic would be strongly anti-fascist and unified in their resistance to Germany out of fear of the bloody retribution that would come if Franco became the puppet ruler of Spain. So there would likely be even more such guerrillas fighting the invading Germans. Thus, the invasion could tie down a lot of German troops and redirect supplies that would be desperately needed on the Eastern Front. In fact, this might mean the Germans don't advance as far into the Soviet Union as they did in our timeline. Indeed, things would be even worse for the Germans in this timeline if Britain intervened in Spain. In our timeline, the British had Operation Pilgrim, which was a plan to occupy Spanish and Portuguese islands in the Atlantic to prevent them from falling into German hands and thus threaten British shipping. The British even had plans to help Franco in case Germany decided to just invade Spain in order to reach Gibraltar. So it's not hard to believe they would do the same for the Spanish Republic. Thus, the British may occupy those islands and land troops directly on the west coast of Iberia to stall the German invasion. And if they manage to hold on to the west coast of Iberia long enough, they may be reinforced by American troops. Hitler starting his own version of the Peninsula War is kind of funny from a historical point of view. Assuming the fascists are finally defeated, what happens next for the Spanish Republic? Well, there is always the possibility that the various leftist political parties would be shut out of the government once again by the victorious allies. Historically speaking, America has a tendency to force governments on nations that they prefer to work with over what the people want, and they could do this in the timeline where the Civil War continued into World War II. So expect repression of communists and anarchists, and also expect Spain being firmly on the side of the capitalist democracies during the Cold War, with Spain even joining NATO decades earlier. Then again, a Spanish Republic that manages to maintain its government and military during World War II might be able to successfully oppose any foreign meddling and thus participate in the Cold War on their own terms. That said, personally I think Spain would be in the Nine Align camp in this alternate timeline. Even if they are a fully communist state, their geographical position means the Soviets can't militarily oppose their will on them like they did in Eastern Europe in our timeline. But at the same time, Spain may not want to antagonize the capitalist democracies. Thus, alternate Spain may follow a path similar to what Finley did in our timeline, which is doing nothing to accept the capitalist democracies while nevertheless being more politically aligned to the Soviets. Otherwise, it becomes harder to guess what this alternate version of Spain is like as time marches on. Would the Basque and Catalans have more autonomy, or would a communist Spain crush any possible separatists in these regions? How do communists in Western Europe react to a communist-friendly Spain? Or if anarchists remain an important political force in the Spanish Republic, how does this impact anarchist movements around the world? If the Sino-Soviet split still happens, what side does Spain choose? And would a Spanish author one day win an award for writing a dystopia where the nationalists won the Civil War? I think it's fair to say that the Spanish Civil War would be an important event for the Spanish people in this alternate timeline as it is in ours. But would the alternate timeline be better than our own? Perhaps it is arrogant of me as someone who isn't Spanish to make such a declaration. But personally, I find any timeline where the fascists are defeated to certainly have merits worth considering. Well, that's all I have to say on the subject. If you enjoy what I do, please like, comment, subscribe, click that bell icon, or support me on Patreon. I'm Matt Mitrich, The Alternate Historian. Bye.